In this video, I want to explain how the probit model can actually be seen as the result of a natural process whereby we're talking about a latent dependent variable. So what do I actually mean by this? So the idea here is that we have a dependent variable yi, which we observe. And the value which yi takes on is either a 1 or it's a 0. And what we actually might suppose is that behind this actually binary decision, there is a sort of continuum um, of factors which are influenced in our, or which are sort of dictated in a particular dependent variable, which we don't actually observe. So we're going to call this y star i. And what we say is that if y i star is greater than zero, let's say, then that is when the result of the decision is a 1, and when yi star is less than or equal to 0, that is when the value of y which we actually observe is found to be a 0. So this sort of notation here where we're talking about y star, y star here is what we refer to as a latent variable. And by latent we mean that it is something which we don't observe. Um, we only actually observe the binary choice, but there are, you can sort of think about between um, absolutely going for a decision and sort of being in between, there are a whole sort of continuum of factors and sort of decision sort of places which are determined by this latent variable y star here. And furthermore, what we suppose is, is we suppose that there is a linear model which determines these sort of latent um, choice model. So we have that yi star is eta equal to beta times xi plus epsilon i. And if we suppose here that, as we have before, that ei is normally distributed with a mean of zero and a variance of sigma squared, then it's quite easy to prove that a probit model is actually going to result naturally um, as a result of this particular process in terms of the latent dependent variable which we don't observe. And note that I haven't included an alpha here, I could have included an alpha plus beta i, uh, beta times xi rather, or I could have included further independent variables, it doesn't change any of the derivation at all, it just makes it a bit easier and more compact to write for me. Okay, so in terms of our model here, we might be interested in finding out what is the probability that yi, so that's the variable we actually observe, the choice which we actually observe, is equal to 1, given that we have xi. Well, we know that this is going to be observed to be a 1 if and only if the latent variable is greater than 0. So this is the probability um, that the latent dependent variable is itself greater than 0, given that we have xi. Because if it's greater than 0, the result of that decision is um, a positive, and if it's less than or equal to 0, the result of that decision is a negative. Okay, and furthermore, we already have an expression for yi star. We have it from this relationship up here. So this probability is just equivalent to beta xi plus epsilon i, given, oh, sorry, the probability that beta xi plus epsilon i is greater than 0, given that we have xi. And I can just rearrange this sort of inequality here. There's nothing wrong with doing that, right, as long as it still says exactly the same thing. So we can write this as the probability that epsilon i is greater than minus beta xi, given that we have xi. Okay, so what are we actually talking about here? Remember that epsilon i we're defining to be a normal random variable. So if I was to draw a graph of epsilon i, it would look something like this. And what we're actually talking about here is in this particular probability which we're evaluating is that we're trying to work out the probability that epsilon i is greater than some negative value of beta times xi. If we, if we assume that xi is positive, that is. So let's say that minus beta xi is somewhere like this. So the probability that epsilon i is greater than that is just the area to the right of this. But symmetrically, this is just completely identical to the probability that beta, or the probability that epsilon is less than beta 
xi. So if I redraw this graph again, it will become a bit more apparent. So essentially the area which we're talking about here is, oh actually I'm going to redraw that normal, it doesn't look quite right. Okay, and the area which we're talking about here is the probability that epsilon i is less than beta xi is just going to be the area to the left of this point here which is evaluated at beta xi. And by symmetry it's easy to see that these two areas which are defined here in this diagram and this diagram are going to be exactly the same due to the symmetry of the normal distribution. So because of that, that means that we can re rewrite the probability again as the probability that epsilon i is less than or equal to beta xi, given that we have xi. So that's just the area to the left of beta xi on our normal uh, PDF. And furthermore, this is just defined in terms of an integral. It's the integral from minus infinity up to beta xi of the normal PDF, which we're going to write as small phi of beta xi dxi. And the integral of the normal PDF we just define in terms of the normal CDF of beta xi. So we've actually proved that in the circumstance where we have this latent variable or latent independent or latent dependent variable rather, which we don't observe, if the error actually undergoes a normal sort of distribution, then a probit model will naturally result in terms of the probability that the variable which we actually observe, which is a, pun a binary dependent variable, is equal to 1. So a probit model in that sense is actually quite a nice natural model in order to examine binary choice models, although practically it doesn't differ that much significantly from that of a logic model.